I'm Kristen. And this is my husband, Michael. Um, I'm the ill spouse. Um, and um, we've found in a, like through this, there has been a lot of people who have come across who have struggled with their relationship, any type of relationships in general, friendships, anything, but um, it really is a struggle with your spouse to make it work because um, it's really, I mean, chronic illness is hard. And um, so just a quick show of hands. How many people in here have either faced a struggle with the spouse or know somebody who has struggled with their spouse <laughs> because of chronic illness? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a it's such a common problem and it's very understandable. So let me preface this with we are in no way, shape, or form experts. Um, we are just two people who have come out stronger and on the other side for what we've been through and actually happier like I wouldn't take back a thing um, I, I couldn't be happier in our life and we have two kids who are affected with this um, moving on so just quick background on us so you know that right from the start there was stuff that we were dealing with uh, we've been together for 23 years now and the first time I ever met Chris was at cultural anthropology class on the very first day of college. She was <laughs> sitting outside the classroom and I was the next person up there. It was my first day of school, my freshman year, and I tried to walk into cultural anthropology and there's a girl that has a, a boot on one of her feet. Um, she's limping around. She's and she's stopping everybody from going in the room it's a culture of anthropology she's like hold on there's still there's still the last class is still in there so we stand out there and there winds up being a line of like 10 people that are out there with us and the professor we stand out there for five minutes the professor pokes pokes her head out she's like are you guys coming in here or what and chris looks at me and was like and by that time, nobody knew it was her that was stopping everybody, but they were waiting for us to come into class. It wasn't the last class. They were waiting for us to start. So we had a whole line up, and we became friends. And then, you know, more than that, as, as we went through college, and the entire time through college, you know, we were both athletes, and she had to give that up halfway through college. We knew there was something wrong. We didn't know what it was, and it, it just got progressively worse the entire time when we were together through college. It went from um, the walking boot to really, really chronic pain, especially in her back and her neck. Terrible, terrible headaches that eventually by her junior year caused her to have to, to stop playing softball and become an assistant coach on the softball team. And we had to try to transition our relationship the entire way through as we started to transition to looking for answers um, for, for what was wrong. And the answers that awaited us were great in one way because sometimes even a bad answer is better than no answer at all um, but it also was really really life-changing as well um, so we have that it was a beautiful disaster from the start so <laughs> that, what that means in our wedding if you see there are two wedding pictures up here our wedding day was sort of a foreshadowing of what was to come in our life um, our limo driver was late he hit something on the way to the church um, <laughs> side swiped the limo the air conditioning stopped working in August um, the flowers were dying right before we walked out walked down the aisle they forgot to pick Michael and the groomsmen up um, <laughs> we were holding our flowers in water and one of the water the water spilled down my bride's one of my bridesmaids dresses and it was so hot in the church that it actually evaporated and right before we went down the aisle that was like a couple minutes and then right when you know the trumpet they had my parents had a trumpet player for you know doo -doo -doo, here i come oh here comes the bride they were rolling down it was a big grand entrance rolling down the aisle runner except the aisle runner shredded the entire way down the aisle and i had no idea what was going on but this is a picture of my mom right here there's the aisle runner people were getting out to cut it and it was a beautiful day but it was a ridiculous start and there's a picture on the other side of 
All my pictures have this beautiful shredded aisle runner now. <laughs> um, then, you know, what could go wrong on our honeymoon? And I landed in the hospital in the Dominican Republic um, and spent two days. We had a fantastic time, though. We just kind of laughed, and I mean, it was a peek at what life had in store for us. Um, so our qualifications for being able to give this presentation, <laughs> well, so we got married in 2005. So this is some of what we've been through, if you want to soak that in. Oh wait, there's more. <laughs> and here's the rest. So many surgeries, um, and you see I highlighted like Brayden and Brody's name. There are kids, there are boys. These are all like procedure surgeries. I've had 39, just had my last, my 39 a month ago. Um, and they had, this isn't even the appointments, like the studies, all of anything. We also made it through the death of a parent. Um, Michael lost his dad years ago, huge support system. He was huge for supporting us. Um, so basically we feel like we've made it through all of this. And not only do we still love each other, but we really like each other. Um, we really enjoy spending time together. So one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about was the, when, with the diagnosis, there are emotions that you feel both as your, the diagnosed partner and your spouse. So real quick, if you could just maybe shout out or whatever, some of the diagnoses you felt when you were diagnosed as the ill person. If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine, but um, if anybody would like to share or say what, what they felt when they were diagnosed, anybody? <coughs> exhausted. Hopeless. Hopeless, exhausted. Fear. Guilt. Oh, yep. Pam, what'd you say? Fear. Fear. So these are all things that I have absolutely felt, fear of the future, um, that it was unfair. Um, I lost my, felt like I lost my purpose and my identity, anger, grief, stress, like betrayed by my body. Um, and I had a mistrust for the medical profession. I felt kind of betrayed by the medical profession as well. And these things were all really, really heavy to carry around, really heavy. So I think a lot of the emotions that you feel as a spouse are are similar in a lot of ways, uh, and and what makes it what made it difficult for me, I think, more than anything else. And these are just some of the some of the emotions that I that I came up with from how I felt. But I think that some that the hardest thing for me is that the picture of what you think your life is going to be you realize that the reality is going to be totally different than the image that you had in your head. So when we got together, she didn't get diagnosed until after we had our, our after we had Brody, after we had our youngest. So we have been together for 10 years, yeah, 10 years before Kristen got diagnosed. You know, we had no idea at that time that it was genetic. We had no idea that it could be passed to our kids. There were so many things that we didn't know. So as we got more and more information on the disease and more and more information on what our life was going to be in the future, we try to keep our kids as healthy and as safe as we could. We realized that a lot of the things that we experienced growing up, it wasn't going to be that for us and our family. And one of the hardest things for me was, was that change in reality of what our life is going to be versus what we thought that it was going to be. Uh, one of the most important things, this is something I was really, really bad at as a spouse in the beginning of all of this stuff happening, is I always felt like I had to be strong for her and everybody else. So all the things that I felt, I bottled up a lot early because I didn't want to put more on her. She was the one that was going through the pain. She was the one that was going through more of the mental struggle than I was, even though that I was a part of it. And what we found out was that that, that is not the way to handle it. Um, it makes the person who is the, 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 who is the, the one that gets diagnosed, 
it makes them start to, to question what you're thinking in your head and stuff when you're not being open and transparent about the feelings that you're going through with your spouse. So we found, you know, open lines of communication have been a hundred times better than me trying to put it all on me and trying to bottle everything up and not talking to her about what I'm feeling. So. And um, so I just have at the bottom, just they're too heavy to carry alone, the emotions, the feelings, everything. Um, you know that there are some that, uh, like he had, he was afraid of the future, so was I. Like share it, you know, you should, feel, you should be able to experience that and talk it out together. Um, so as, if you can talk with your spouse, it makes it so much easier to carry that. Um, and then some of the things, the struggles and stressors that impact your relationships. So um, if you would like to talk it over or maybe share or shout out, whatever you feel like, um, some of the struggles that you have dealt with or um, know somebody that dealt with that you think might be barriers in the relationship. It's about the financial. It's a huge one. And that is my first one up there. <laughs> <laughs> the like need to fix and the helplessness battle. Anybody else? Yeah. Change your moves. Feeling like a burden. Yeah. So I think I don't have strong enough fingers. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to bring all of um, them up at the same time. Um, so you guys kind of nailed what <laughs> you, about that last you nailed it. Um, the, you know, also I feel feeling alone. Like I, you feel like that nobody understands what you're going through. Even like Michael as, um, he didn't want to talk to anybody, any of his friends, anyone, because he felt like they didn't understand. How could they possibly understand what it's like to see their wife struggle day after day after day? Um, the the roles that we play in a relationship, you know, a lot of times it was like he was a single parent because I was down for the count, and that's really difficult. Um, all of them are strains and struggles on the relationship. Um, the le the one thing that I do want to draw attention to is the outsider comments. And I think that's something that probably a lot of us have faced where someone kind of, when we're already beaten down and, you know, we're struggling with our diagnosis and we're feeling not as strong as we should be, um, maybe not at a great mental space, when someone makes comments to you that they mean in a really a complimentary way to your, like my, my husband, um, it was pretty defeating. Um, I got, your husband is amazing for staying on you. I'm sure a lot of you have MC head shaking. Um, uh, like, why? I, I think I'm pretty awesome a lot in the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, gosh, you know, I'm already trying to figure out my self-worth here and, you know, what my purpose is and my value. And then when someone acts like, well, why, do, why is he still with you? He could leave and go up. You know, it's, it, it's a, it's a battle. Like that's something that you have to keep. Re I had to keep reminding myself, and and I talked with Michael about it a lot. Like that was something that I found early on. I needed to communicate and let him know. You know, some of these things were really bothering me, and he assured me. I hope you know I don't feel that way. I I do not feel that way. Um, and he he also said he was lucky that he was with me. He felt lucky. So I have a question. Did you ever disagree on a treat? So, <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> most of the time, I, when when she would go into surgery, whatever the problem is that she would have, I had seen it so much that she that it, she needed the help that I, I was always just ready. So I, I really did it, you know. And from the start, and I. The financial part is super, super stressful. Like, we're a one-income house. Yeah. Um, she had to stop working and wasn't going to stop working until I told her, like, Chris, we can't do this again. You know, she she was a teacher for four years. Right, four years? 
five years, and the, the last two years she was she had to go on you know sabbaticals because of some major surgeries and missed almost the entire year. And we were coming down on that summer ready to for she was ready to go back and and try again. I'm like, Chris, we can't we can't do this. Well, you just got to learn to figure it out. Like we we have to figure it out, but you can't put your stuff and your body through this anymore. And I think one of the biggest. I don't know. One of the biggest agreements for us that that put that put it less stressful is I said that I would be willing to. I don't care if we have to go into debt. I don't. I don't care what it is. Like you're getting the best treatment. Like period. So yes, the finances are stressful, extremely stressful. But because that was never an issue in terms of like mentally, that we already said we're going to the best doctors, you're getting the best care. Then you know I mean, we really did it. We did it. We. If she I thought I, she needed. I just kind of trust her because she's. That's I mean, she's an expert on this stuff, and even more so than me. And I feel like I'm. I know a lot, and I made myself really knowledgeable, but not like to the level that she does. So I just trust that when she says she needs something, she needs it. Right. So basically, that became our roles. Is I did the research. I found the best doctors. I was you know, and he just took the role of I'll trust you and I'll take you wherever you need to go. Yeah. Is Dr. Referring to surgery for you or surgery for the kids? Well, both. Like so, both. Like if so, if one doctor says we should do this and one doctor says we should do that, which happened a lot. And and what happened else a happened a lot was me being blamed for pushing my diagnosis on my kids. Um, <coughs> He, we did not because he saw how bad it was, how bad I had gotten, that we knew the symptoms. We knew the stuff that was going on. So it was just if the doctor said, no, it's this, we kind of we knew better and we trusted. No, we know we've dealt with this. Um, we also had, you know, at the point with the boys, we had the, the group of, you know, I met I met Pam early on, and we had talked it all through, and um, so we kind of just knew, you know. We, but you always stood together. We did. Always. Always. That's and part of it always. was that the focus, the focus changed. With the boys, the focus changed. Like in the beginning with the boys, I mean, I remember <laughs> when we found out it was genetic, it was was. It was pretty horrifying. It was because because immediately you start thinking, like, you know, I'm, I'm a head football coach. I played basketball in college. Chris was an athlete. She was an awesome softball player and soccer player and that's what. And immediately you're like, I don't know. When you come from a sports background, you think your kids are going to follow in your footsteps. You think they're going to do the same thing that you do. And thinking of that future without those things was a really really hard transition in the beginning. But. I think it was a blessing and a curse that she was so symptomatic. But her being so symptomatic and needing 39 surgeries, my focus completely changed to uh, the boys are not going through what she went through. They're just not. We, we need to make sure that at all costs, they're not going to have the life that she had in terms of her pain. So when we changed our focus to that, I think it made us always on the same page. You know, even though it was hard, it was always put us on the same page with this is what's best for the boys in their future. So for our family, because we have twins with carry issues, my husband and I, and we've been married 24 years this October, we are currently going through number seven social withdrawal. We don't have any support system in Missouri because our family has turned on both sides against us through social media. Our family has now been on social media for 15 years, and we've been going through a lot. And when Stephen, our twin brother, got surgery at the age of seven, my husband said the family would not support us. They would not even call after his surgery to see how he was doing, <coughs> if he even made it through surgery. They would not show up at Children's Hospital in St. Louis. And then with the social media issues, how, how does your family feel like that? There is a social media issue with your family. So, I mean, I can speak where that's something that we are unbelievably blessed and lucky with, mm -hmm. is that our support systems on both sides have been tremendous. Now, there have been... Misunderstanding. I, yeah. And, as and we were learning. As we're learning in the beginning, there was misunderstandings, that were, but 
not only has, especially her mom, but not only has like our, our family kind of embraced it, but they become advocates for it too. You know, we, we host the huge walk every year. And we'll talk about some of that stuff that we kind of do together, but we've kind of made it Chris and then me, you know, supplementary, but Kristen as the spearheading of it, it's become kind of like a mission to not let this happen to other people as much as possible. We've kind of made it into our thing. So, but but we're blessed because our support systems are strong. Now with friends, I, I think it was more of an issue of like, of friends and stuff, not understanding and getting- We've, we've lost a lot of friends. Yes. They don't understand. They just don't. That's and, what I- And you feel bad saying no all the time. Yes. Because eventually they just stop inviting you to do the stuff unless it's a true friend that understands. Right. But the invitation still matters even though we can't do it. You know what I mean? So it's that that part is really hard. The social withdrawal part is very, very difficult. But that was I mean, we're blessed that we have we have really supportive you know, my mom and, and her parents. So, so we're lucky. So to add, and to add on to that, like I think um, it almost, like, we had people who did not, uh, friends um, who didn't understand, who questioned. And um, to, I would say, joint, like you're in the right place. Thank you. Um, and find, you know, the fact that you're with yes. our group right now, I, when I found my people who got it, like the, this group, the people who understand what I'm going through, I found that it took so much less energy um, because I wasn't trying to explain myself. So now when I'm around my friends, the way I choose to he handle it is I don't talk about it. It's it's unspoken, it's untalked about, and I just say, I'm sorry, I just want to forget, like don't, because a lot of times I found that when people asked me how things were going, that it was almost annoying that I told them how things were they don't, going. They don't really want to know. Yeah. yeah, so I just said, good, and then I move on, you know, so, um, and then I use, you know, this this group, the support groups, that, and them turning virtual was huge. And so I kind of have all these little spaces of who I surround myself with and, and who Michael, sort, like he does as well, of who gets it and who we're honest with. And then who we tell nothing to, but they're great for taking my mind off of my everyday struggles. And part of that too, especially with her, is that the disease is not, it's not who you are. It's something you have. It's not who you are. So if, if for a lot of people, I feel like it can become who you are and then it gets talked about all the time. It's, and for her, it's something I've always admired. It's like, she, she doesn't want that. She just wants to be treated more, you know, so. And, and it is, a, it is a, like I said before, it's a part of me, like it absolutely is, and I have an everyday reminder of it, but I'm proud of it because I still can, you know, I still consider myself successful despite what I've been through, you know, I, mean, I haven't given up. So I feel like it's something to also be proud of. And if somebody is not going to, you know, be proud of your fight and be proud of what you're up then, I mean, my feeling is like, I don't want to surrender around myself with those people if they're going to bring any type of negativity. We have so much negative that we have to deal with already. I, I just need the positive in my life. Can I just offer, and this is not to upset the young adults in the room, my daughter is now 30 and at 19 she had two brain tumors and it was traumatic. She came out of them and she does great. But it was traumatic in those college years and right after that, as her uncle said, to realize she's not like her friends anymore. She is distinctly different in that way. And it's hard for her peers to understand her difference. If you would look at her, you would never know she had this traumatic event. But it's that peer support group that's, that you go set up here for these young adults. But without that, it can be very difficult to feel excluded. But like Rocky said, you're not, this, you're not them anymore. And you just have to make yourself accepted and accept yourself. Yeah. So I hope I don't understand the young, young adults in the room, but that's what she went through. 
1920, 1925. It was hard. And they've all experienced that. Like, yeah. Our youngest is right there. Like he, he's going through that with his friends. Like it, they, and his answer is the same as hers. Like he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk about it with them. You know what I yes. mean? Except the people he's absolutely closest with. If yes. he, other than he just wants to be treated more, you know. And it's it's hard. It's really hard. Because yeah. people just they they can't get it. It's impossible to get it unless you live with it every day. It just and, is. And accepting that, you know, understanding that's yes. starting point is really helpful. And that's what I think it's important that. Um, I, I tell the kids and I feel like that you don't have to understand and because I think it's impossible to understand what we live, how we live every day. I think it's really kind of impossible, but you do have to accept me for who I am. And, you know, and I think that's a really important thing that I've talked to. I, ju I just had the conversation with my other son the other day about nobody's gonna understand your pain and, you know, send, like, don't give it that energy of trying to explain because people will say, my knee, kids will say, oh, I did, my knee hurts too, or I turned my ankle. Like it's not, it's just not the same thing. And so that can be frustrating. I choose to not spend my energy there. Um, and, the, but I mean, every, you know, everyone's different and everyone, some people really want everybody to understand. I just feel like I have a limited supply. Um, um, so I'm told a lot that we're really lucky, which don't get me wrong, I do think we're lucky. Um, I, I was very lucky to stop Michael outside of class that day. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really, it's work and it is commitment to make this stuff happen. And these are some, I mean, just seeing this is my oldest who's not here. He's homesick right now. Um, that's Brody who's sitting right there in the middle and Brayden's helping him. And um, there I am over there in the hospital bed. Um, it hasn't been easy. It's a lot of work, uh, but it's been well worth it. Um, as I'm just going to breeze through this, we, Michael and I both have this sports mindset. We had sports growing up, and I'm somebody who likes to connect dots and find purpose. And you know, and I started to look at um, how my life has made me into who I am today, and how I was almost set up for, you know, to be successful with a health battle. And we, when you look back, everybody says, you know, sports are, are a setup for life, and mine legitimately was. Um, the no quit mentality, you know, my dad used to tell me all the time, leave your heart on the field, and, you know, nobody could compete with your heart, and, you know, I feel like that's kind of how I live my life right now, like, I have a limited amount of time here, and I want to leave my heart here with, it, you know, and do everything I can while I'm here. Um, the idea of controlling the controllables and, uh, you know, we heard earlier about resilience and perseverance. Like, these are all things that I learned through sports, that Michael learned through sports, commitment. And Pam and I have had this conversation so many times. It set us up in life to be successful. Um, also, just that competitive mindset that we both have like crazy. Um, I hate losing and he hates losing. So, you know, we want to win at life. And this is just an example of... <laughs> we'll talk about that later. This was a surprise! <laughs> I snuck this in. This is I hate losing so much that I am winning at a game at home, so I just put this in. You know, you gotta keep you gotta keep it excited. You gotta keep it excited. I put this on an ornament on every year because I am the champion of Racco in our house. So. This is years of scores that have been we used to argue all the time about who was the best at Racco. I don't know if you know what Racco is, but we play Racco, Chris and I. We'll talk more about it. We play Racco every Saturday and Sunday morning. It's like the first thing we do when she comes downstairs and has her coffee. We play Racco together. 
Um, and she decided that she's going to start tallying the scores. So he oh, always oh. was trying to take advantage of my brain fog, and he'd go, "I won the last five. I won the last seven. Uh uh." So I was like, on, "Oh no!" She's been on a she's been on a hot streak. She's been on a hot streak. I'll get it back. All right. So with the sports stuff, we, we we decided the way we were going about our family was to use a team mentality. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So. I, I think the single, and when we talked about this, about this presentation, the, when Chris said, what do you think like the, the number one key to like our relationship being successful is? And she wrote down what she thought, and I talked about what I thought, and it matched up, and it's it's team. That everything you look at is, when, when she's going into something, it's us. It's not her. It's us. When when I'm going into something, um, it, it's us. It's always us. It's never just Chris has surgery. Chris has this. It's us. And we, we try to, to attack everything as a team. So the things that go into it, and, and I'm going to breeze over this because some of the things we've already talked about, but that you got to communicate open and honestly that when we make a decision together, like, and not every decision that we've made has been the right one, um, but that we're all in together. And then when we go in and we decide, like, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do next, this is the doctor we're going to go see, that even if it doesn't work, we're all in together. It's never, uh, oh, I can't believe we just wasted an entire day there. No, we, we went in together. Um, the, we celebrate each other's accomplishments. I, I, <laughs> I get like giddy proud of who she is and what she's overcome like giddy giddy excited proud when i talk to other people about how tough my wife is like she's a badass she just <laughs> she's had 39 surgeries she's beautiful like she she still she's just I, she's the best so i i get super proud and when i have my stuff that i've been successful out of my life the, she's my biggest cheerleader, you know, so I, I think that you have to celebrate each other's accomplishments You have to celebrate each other's successes um, Set goals together of what you need to do for your family, but also have individual goals that the other one buys into and we'll talk more about that later as well um, and this is Accountability is the biggest one for her with me because she holds me accountable to be and she, her, her, her quote always is like, you have to be the best version of yourself. You have to be the best version of yourself. And sometimes I'll be like, oh my God, like, <laughs> stop. I don't want to be the best version of myself right now. I just want to be annoyed. Just let me go. And she's, you know, she's poly positive, making me be the best version of myself. So she holds me accountable to be that, um, encouraging me knowledge efforts. And no, she has the about be the best version of yourself. <laughs> And so, it, just to draw attention real fast to acknowledge efforts, it's really important. I found like Michael, it, he definitely appreciates when I let him know that I see what he's doing. I see the work he's putting in. I see when I'm down that he's doing more laundry and he's running himself crazy. And just to let him know that I appreciate it, that goes a long way. Um, I think it's really easy to, uh, I wish I could do that. You know, that's, I, I got stuck a little bit there at the beginning too, where, you know, I was wishing I could be like the tired partner. I was wishing I could be the one that had to go to work and take care of him. And, but it didn't work like that. I mean, that's it. That's not a, con you know, that's out of my control. And um, so it's, it's important to let, just, just to let them know you see what they're doing and that it is appreciated. Um, this is my dog had to make an appearance. <laughs> um, this is just something I thought nobody can make you happy until you're happy with yourself first. And that's what I, it's really important to be the best version of yourself because you do have to. It's like, you know, your every day is game day. Um, if if you're not healthy, if you're not taking care of your mental and your physical health, then you know you're gonna get worn out. So, and you have to figure out um, all of the mental exercises that you need to do. If you're in a bad spot, listen. I mean, that's what today is all about. Um, you you have to try to work your way out of it. There's things we can't control. What's going wrong in our bodies? The physical stuff like that is we can't do anything about it. But we can try to make ourselves better 
and um, work on our happiness. Um, so we heard a little of this earlier about prioritizing. Um, you know, chronic illness is exhausting. So you do have to prioritize your life. And, you know, priorities are gonna change. Things are gonna change as, as you get older and as like our kids get older. Um, we found that you re we really do have to carefully plan your life. And I, going to the sports mentality, it's kind of like a practice plan for a, for a coach. And um, you know, you do have to have some sort of lineup so you know what what am I going to do if you're if you're sitting there, you know, all day and not knowing what your day holds or not knowing what your goals are or not knowing and not knowing who you're going to hang out with or where you're going to spend your energy. Um, it's tough. We as humans, we, we, we kind of like thrive on structure. And so it's important that you work together to prioritize. Um, we have uh, the idea of like what your must-haves should be as to feel happy and fulfilled. Everybody's are going to be different. Um, Michael and I are pretty simple people, but um, one of the things that we had that helped us is figuring out what our must-haves were to feel fulfilled. And and as soon as COVID happened, we did the exact same thing. M uh, Michael, what do you need to feel happy? Like we made sure that we got a gym in our garage because gyms were closed down. You know, we you have to prioritize and figure out how to keep the important things in your life and what you can get rid of because we, we really do have limited energy. So you guys have a blank one of these um, that we have where we it's scheduling time for us. We just filled out an example of the little things that we do um, to make sure that we stay connected and stay as a happy couple and um, you know you'll see some competition in there. Um, we text each other wordle scores. Um, <laughs> which we should start tallying. Uh, which, which we should start tallying that one too, but we don't because she knows that I win more than she does. <laughs> I can't play early in the morning, you know, the brain's not on yet. <laughs> um, Saturday and Sunday, Michael likes his alone time, so we make sure that he gets that. He reads his book on the couch super early, and he brings me coffee in bed, so I'm good. So, you know, and then we play racco together. Um, that we train, we make sure we train together at least two times a week. We have a family show and us time every every night and weekend. Um, we always have a family show, like with the boys, and then an us show, just us when the boys are with their friends and that stuff. That, so we always have something that we can kind of just lock into when we want to veg out. And we always take two long walks on Saturday and Sunday with the dog. That's very important to me. And. Um, and we have family dinner Sunday through Thursday, no exceptions, no matter what time we have to eat, we make sure that we all come back for family dinner. Um, it's something that we found has been really important in staying connected and staying uh, as a solid family unit. Which is why dinner for us normally is around eight o'clock at ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have also monthly must-haves. Um, you know, some of you guys may want to travel. Some of you may want to, you know, hang out with friends. Michael and I are not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any monthly must -haves. So this is our chart of monthly must <laughs> Um And then here's, we have also have, whoops. Sunday and then A. <laughs> um, this is our chart of like how we schedule things in um, where we do approximate times. And we don't feel, don't think that we have this on our calendar that we're yeah. filling out. <laughs> we just kind of did it by what happens organically in our house. Yeah. But this is just, you know, that you can guide some of the things that you, to make sure that you're doing things together. We really wanted to have something like tangible and an idea because it is hard for some people to figure out how to plan this. So it, and it does take planning to make relationships work. So um, this is just an example for us. And we we don't do like times or you know it's not because 
I don't know when I'm good. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, we just kind of morning, night. Um, and then we have a team mentality. So this is important for everybody to sit down and talk about like goals that you need to feel fulfilled individually and um, then what your spouse is willing to contribute. And if the spouse is willing to contribute nothing, then that's something that needs to be know known up front. Um, we also, I mean, honestly, with all of these things, our boys get, like, when Michael took the head coaching job, it was a full family decision and discussion about what was going to happen. So we, we make sure that it's, you know, we align our goals and that we both have a plan of how we can feel fulfilled. And so goals can change according to where you are in your health. And um, this was me. I don't know how to get it to play. Oh, press it one more time. Oh, oops. That's weird. Usually it'll do it pretty quick. <laughs> so this was a month ago. Oh, it's because it's a. Um, I mean, I saw you. Yeah, you don't worry about it. So basically, you will, would have seen me walking, barely walking, like really, really slow. And that was a month ago. I went in for a new brain shot, which I've carefully covered my hair <laughs> to cover um, and I came out with sciatica why I have no idea but it was brutal and I had a really hard time even just walking down the street so my goal at that point was to walk to the mailbox and it took like an hour but I did it and Michael helped me and you can see my dog is there too because she it is my favorite so this is an example. Go ahead. Yeah. So with the individually just just to give an idea of like for our goals of what I said, like we talked about each other about what, what are the things that are your must haves. I only have two, and the part of this is sacrificing things that were that vision of the future. You know, we, we thought that we were going to be running to our kids' sporting stuff, that we're going to be traveling, that we're gonna, which we have not done any of, like that we're going to have this life. A lot of that stuff was sacrificed, and now it's just so it's so far in the past that it's, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice anymore. It just is our norm, and our norm, like we're pretty happy. The two things that were my individually to, to feel individually fulfilled outside our family stuff were the, the gym time stuff is huge for me. Like the, the I do powerlifting stuff, and like that that's a huge part of my life too, is to be able to train. So training for me keeps me sane. Um, it, it's my de-stressor. Like I, I don't you know I, I don't drink. I don't do go out with friends. I don't go to but I have to go to the gym, I have to. So because I have to go to the gym, you know, Chris knows, because she's the same way, luckily, but she knows that that's something that I have to have. Um, so we tried to make it that it was as, you know, as possible as we could by having the stuff I need in the garage, plus we have a gym membership. So that part of my life, like she's fully in support of. Like she said, we made a team decision on me becoming a head football coach. I've been coaching football for 17 years, but only became a head coach eight years ago. And that was a, that was a team decision. That was not an individual decision. If, if the boys in Kristen would have said, like, I don't think this is best for the family, and we all talked about it, that would have been a tough pill for me to swallow, which is why I, I don't think they even thought about not uh, not doing because we all knew that that was like the path that I wanted to take eventually. But we went in and on it where we're all in, you know, just like I'm all in with every time she has surgery, every time every time we have stuff for football, it's it's a family thing, getting the entire family involved that she comes to all the games, the boys come to the games, we go to team dinner, all my players, they know my family, you know what I mean? They know my wife, she, they're, they're visible presence 
uh, at every part of that that football journey that I've taken. So that that's a huge part of us trying to contribute to each other's individually goal individual goals to feel fulfilled. And so mine mine had to be a little bit simpler. I mean, I I don't have a lot um, of to give when you know the kids are home and you know they're my priority, but. Um, I had to find a purpose for the pain. You know, it needed to make sense to me why I was going through all of this. And um, for me, so that became one of my goals, but it's that I wanted to help others who were facing the same struggles. You know, I didn't want anybody to have to go through the stuff that I went through. So that became one of my goals. And whatever, in whatever way I could contribute, and if, you know, someone struggling with that idea there could be such a simple way even just showing up to the support groups and if you you'd be shocked at adding one one comment or one thing into the support groups that sits with somebody and makes them feel understood you know that's that's a purpose you know that's it doesn't need to look the same for everybody if you're thinking I'm not somebody who has the capability of helping others. I kept waiting for the right time. And I was like, one day, one day, I'm gonna wait for the right time till my bed. And then I realized, nope, life just continues to punk us. So and there's never a right time. You know, I have to make it the right time. So my goal, um, that, and Michael supports me with everything. He gets his team involved. He helps fundraise. He, um, if I asked him to join a meeting, he would. You know, he's spoken to people with me to um, to help other families through. Uh, the other thing is my biggest goal is to keep my body, mind, everything as healthy as possible. And um, he does it. He helps me with it. He encourages me. Um, he holds me accountable. He also tells me when I'm pushing it too much because I tend to do that. And um, I also have these, you know, mindful activities and, you know, all of the activities of working on your mental state. And Which are always Brody and Brandon's favorite. And he didn't always love it, but I thought it was really important to teach the kids how to be successful with this and how to train their minds and it has worked so they didn't love it you know but it has worked um and that's it and this is just <laughs> when life gives you lemonade make lemons life will be all like what <laughs> that's still dumpy <laughs> thank you <laughs>